Hello, everyone. Welcome to Summit 2023 Restoration. We're so glad that you joined us here today, live or watching the recording later. My name is Marcus Cole, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Director of Church Engagement and Outreach here at the Evangelical Environmental Network. And this year is our third EEN Summit. We have a lot planned for you today, a lot in store. We have a keynote speaker. We have a program update from a lot of our wonderful staff. We have a chance for you to join breakout sessions and interact together with each other, talking about lots of different opportunities. We have a special message from the EPA administrator. We also have another uh, message from our executive director and president towards the end and lots and lots and lots of opportunities for you to get involved individually or as a community as we head into this year. Before we get down that road though, I do wanna do a couple of things, mention some housekeeping rules, and then I'm gonna pray and then we'll open up. First and foremost, we do ask that you keep your line on mute. Remember, we are recording this and we're also live streaming this today. So we wanna make sure that everyone, whether they're here live, watching the stream or watching a recording later has an opportunity to hear from all the wonderful guests. We do encourage you though to interact in the chat. Several of my friends and colleagues are in the chat responding to questions and responding to any comments that you might have. So please put those in there. Also, we will be providing the slides and the recording early next week. So while you're encouraged to take the notes that are meaningful to you, you'll also get an opportunity to get all this information later as well. So please feel free to just relax and listen and appreciate what's going on. Now with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pray and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this moment and we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that comes alongside us to help us follow your son, Jesus, well. We just submit this time and our planning and our energies and all the things that we brought into this moment to you. We submit it at the foot of the cross to your son, Jesus. And we ask that your Holy Spirit work in our hearts, that it reveal things to us, and that it help us come alongside the work that you're already doing so that we can advance your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. We do all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So I don't want to just spend most of the time talking. I'd love for you in the chat to put where you're joining us from and what inspires you to care for creation. So just take a few seconds and think, what inspires you to care for creation and where are you joining from? As you're doing that, I'm going to show a short video sharing some of the work that you've done over the past year.
Yeah, I love that video. I, I love seeing all the hard work that you all got a chance to do last year in partnership with the Holy Spirit. I know as the director of church engagement and outreach, I get to see a lot of that work behind the scenes. I get to interact with a lot of you over the phone, through email, in person now. But uh, I want you to just take a moment and look through the chat box. Look at where all these people are and why they care for creation. I mean, you could start on the East Coast. You could start in D.C. You could start in New York and Pennsylvania. You could move to the Midwest and Michigan, Ohio. You can go down south where I am in Georgia. You can go out west, California. We have people in Colorado. We have people all over in this community, and they all care for God's creation. And I just really want you to be hanging on to that thought as we go into our next part of the summit here today, because we have a really wonderful guest speaker today, and that's Deborah Reinstra. She's the author of Refugia Faith, Seeking Hidden Shelters, Ordinary Wonders, and the Healing of the Earth. And I'll tell you, I have the book already. I'm excited for you to hear from her today and for you to go to that breakout group because Deborah is a dear, dear friend. She's a professor of English at Calvin University, where she has taught since 1996, specializing in early British literature and creative writing. She's the author of four books, as well as numerous academic essays, literary essays, and poems. This most recent book that she's here to talk to us about today, Refugia of Faith, and uh, Seeking Hidden Shelters, Ordinary Wonders, and the Healing of the Earth, was just released in 2022. It's a book that combines theology, nature writing, and biological principles to consider how Christians must adapt our faith and practice for a climate-altered planet. Another thing I love about Deborah is that she is one of our original partners, and some of you have been through the Partners Program virtually or live, and so I love that we have an opportunity to highlight folks just like you that are around the country that care about creation and have a gifting and a skill and then really put that into the world. So with that, I'm gonna stop talking and invite Deborah to come off of mute and share a little bit for us today as our keynote speaker. Hi everybody, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you, Marcus. I'm so grateful to you and to Kyle and to Jessica and all the wonderful people at EEN. Um, I've really been privileged to get to know you a little bit over the past few years and I so admire the work that you do. And I'm just really glad to be a part of this event today and honored to be able to speak to you all. So hello, everybody from all over the place. I'm coming to you from Michigan, as you can see, and it's great to be here. I'm going to share my screen and tell a little story about Refugia Faith. I'll explain to you what that strange word means. And um, I hope leave you with a kind of interesting question to think about. All right. So you would not be here today if you are not well aware that we are in the midst of a climate crisis. Maybe you've been reading the news about California lately. Maybe you're living there, living through the flooding and uh, remembering the wildfires. But all you have to do is watch the news headlines to know that the climate crisis is here and now, and it's affecting people and creatures all over the planet. But of course, that's not all. We are also keenly aware of the other crises that we're facing right now. We just came through the worst of the pandemic, which continues to linger. We are dealing, of course, with racism, racial inequities, wealth inequality, political division, so painful in the US, rising authoritarianism. It seems like there's more every day. You know this, you feel this. And so as, as a student of history and especially a student of the Reformation period, you can kind of spot a big historical inflection point <laughs> when it's hitting us. And I think that's what we feel. We are living in a time of crisis convergence and upheaval. And that means we're at a kind of inflection point. So the thing about inflection points is that they are really good times to ask, once again, who are we? What could be different? And especially what is our role as Christians in this moment? acknowledging that not every moment in history is like this. So what does it mean to be Christians here and now in this moment, this generation of history? So as an English professor, you know I'm immediately gonna to go to metaphors. So let's think about metaphors. What are the metaphors that we often maybe consciously, maybe unconsciously 
depend upon to think about our role as Christians at this point in history. So some people, as you well know, think of us as, well, we need to be dwellers in the bunker. We need to find like-minded people and find a hiding place and just shut this crazy world out and try to create our own kind of safe communities and just not pay attention to what's happening. Or maybe we think of ourselves as sort of museum curators, like we have this heritage of faith and our job is to preserve it uh, against the unwashed hordes <laughs> that might come in and disturb these treasures that we have. Or this is a very common one in the US right now. Maybe we're warriors in a culture war. Everybody loves the warrior metaphor. It's so exciting and it makes you feel so powerful and righteous. Or maybe we're victims of the culture wars and we are the persecuted ones. Or maybe we're witnesses. And if so, what are we witnesses to in this moment? So all of these are potential metaphors that maybe churn around in our conscious and unconscious thoughts and sometimes in our actions and words. Well, I'm gonna propose maybe a different metaphor for us to think about. What if we thought of ourselves as the people of refugia. Okay, so now I have to define that strange word. So the best way to define it, I think, comes from the wonderful moral philosopher and nature writer, Kathleen D. Moore, who tells this story in her book, Great Tide Rising, about the eruption of Mount St. Helens. Maybe you remember this if you're old enough from 1980, Mount St. Helens in Washington state, um, erupted in the spring of 1980 and uh, it was a really devastating eruption. You're seeing an image here after the eruption. Um, the explosion was so huge. It devastated the mountainside, literally blew the trees down and covered everything with this layer of death ash. And at the time, biologists thought, we are not going to see any green here for decades. This is going to take generations to revitalize this place. But lo and behold, 25 years later, the whole mountainside had greened up, maybe not right at the top where the actual explosion was in the caldera, but so much of it had greened up. And the reason was that even under that layer of ash, there were these tiny shelters where life survived. And there's a term for that. There's a biological term that was already in existence. They're called refugia, little places under a log where the moss survived, little tunnels where the moles survived. And it's from those little refugia places that the mountain was able to green up again. Those little places persisted, spread, connected, greened up the mountain again. So our official biological definition is that refugia are habitats that components of biodiversity retreat to, persist in, and can potentially expand from under changing environmental conditions. So basically they're little pockets where life survives amid crisis places where capacities rebuild. This is how nature renews itself in times of great disturbance. So this is a whole field of biology I discovered after learning this word and thinking this is really cool. Um, the field of refugial conservation biology is always interested in when there's a disaster, why do some places survive and others don't? What is resilience in this particular area? So you see an image here of little refugial spots from fire or from drought and heat, or from insect infestation. So why do some of these trees survive and some don't? Is it because they're on the north side? Is it because they have extra water right there? That's what refugial conservation biology studies. So when I started learning about this, I thought this is all so evocative. And it just made me understand a little bit more about what refugia do in nature. They're meaningful because they protect transform, connect, revive in ways very particular to the context. So I thought, wait a minute, isn't this a really good metaphor for what we should be as Christians? Shouldn't we be the people of refugia? Shouldn't we be the ones who find and nurture these life-giving spaces? And I thought about the scriptures and I thought, you know, it sure seems like God loves refugia. If you look at the story of salvation and redemption throughout scripture, God loves to work through small, hidden, inconsequential things, through remnants. Think about Noah's Ark and the story of the flood and how that Ark became this refugial space. Or Abraham's family, 
God chooses this most unlikely family to be the means through which God blesses all the nations. Or the Israelites in the desert, this little refugia people having come out of slavery, having to rebuild their capacities. Jesus and the disciples, God does not send an army to sweep and conquer. God sends Jesus in the form of an infant who gathers around him a small band of disciples. And it's through that mechanism that God renews all the earth. Jesus told parables like this, the seeds, the yeast, the small that influences the large, the small that grows and influences the large. So if refugia are nature's mechanism of resilience, and there's this lovely analogy to the way we see God working in scripture, maybe this moment in history demands that we become resilient healers. So the question then becomes, how can we as Christians together find and nurture refugia? literally in creation, but also in our human cultural systems, in our churches, in our spiritual lives. What do human refugia look like? So that's really what I've been meditating on for the past few years. And the book is really an attempt to sort of work through that in my own life, but also in a way that others can maybe take away from and find um, suggestive for their own faith and for their own communities. So that's really what the question was for the book. How must our faith and practice adapt for these times? And I came to think of it as a bunch of transformations. What transformations do we need to go through in order to become, to lean into this idea of being people of resilience and healing? And of course, as we all know, repentance, turning, requires that we leave some things behind. So what do we have to leave behind right now? What capacities do we need to build and work on? And, you know, I just, the more I thought about this, the more I thought we really do have the resources we need in the Christian faith and tradition. We just have to find those treasures again. Some of the treasures that we need right now have been sort of covered up or set aside, maybe put up in the attic. We need to find those again. And we might need to make new ones based on the old ones. So here's a list of the transformations, and this is really the structure of the book. Transformations from despair to preparation, from avoiding to lamenting and so on. And each of these transformations in the book is sort of mapped out on a liturgical season. Um, my church observes the liturgical seasons very robustly and joyfully. And so I've come to think of faith as uh, a kind of cycle of these patterns of theological reflection and worship and um, uh, focusing on different aspects of the life of Christ, which is what the liturgical seasons are based on. And it just so happened that these kind of transformations mapped really nicely onto the liturgical seasons. So it was just a way to sort of organize theological topics as I thought about these ways of leaving behind and building capacities. So I'll just give you one example here. Transformation three from consuming to healing. This is the idea that we have come to see ourselves, especially as affluent Americans, as consumers. This is our sort of role in society as we consume things. But of course, that's a very limited and not very Christian way of seeing ourselves. So to move from the idea of consuming to becoming these healers, um, and even the word stewardship, you know, which has been so useful and is so important, in a way, it's not quite enough, because it sort of assumes that we are stewarding something, taking care of something that's already okay. But actually we need to do better than that because that stewardship vocation that comes from Genesis, that's great, it's important, but we're not actually in Genesis two. We are post to Genesis three. And right now we are living on a damaged earth. So we have to take that stewardship idea and actually put another layer on top of that and think of ourselves as healers of a damaged earth. So as affluent Americans who are used to asking the world, you know, sort of what do we want? No, that's not the right question now. The question is what needs healing and how can I help? So Randy Woodley is a Cherokee pastor. Um, he's a Cherokee and also a pastor, Christian pastor. And he likes to challenge us to use, instead of the word kingdom, to practice in our minds, using the word kingdom instead, or um, thinking of the word kingdom as instead community of creation. The community of creation is near. Christ comes to fulfill 
the community of creation, just to remind us that the kingdom of God is about this earth as well. So this all maps nicely onto the season of Epiphany, because Epiphany is when we reflect on the story of the life of Christ, and especially Christ as healer. So those healing stories become our kind of model. Okay, I lied. One more example. Um, this is the second to the last chapter in the book, the transformation from passivity to citizenship. Now you're here because you've already made partly that transformation for sure. But this is the idea that yes, we reverence God, we worship God, but that's not the end of the story. We are not merely passive, passive bower downers. <laughs> Sorry, that's a terrible word. We are the friends of Christ. Before his passion, Christ says to the disciples, I have called you friends. And that means we're called to agency and responsibility. We are citizens in this resurrection community. And it's really tempting to avoid that because it's hard, it's costly, it's difficult, it's frightening. And the only way we can do it, the only way we can do this is by the power of the spirit. And that's why this transformation maps nicely onto Pentecost season, where we reflect on uh, the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's work in us and in the church. So those are just a couple examples of how those sort of transformations come out in the book. The book is also full of examples of what refugia look like. So here's just one that I think is a really nice one because it's both literal and sort of figurative. Um, so this is a lovely church in Granville, Michigan that used to be called Trinity Christian Reformed Church. Now they've changed their names. I had nothing to do with this. They changed their names to the Refuge Church and they have three main mission uh, principles. One is outdoor discipleship. So they are literally making a refugia on the back of their property. They have a stream. A uh, youth group at this church is doing macroinvertebrate studies. So <laughs> that's what they do for their youth group. Um, they are literally healing the stream at the back of their church. But they also have a very robust refugee ministry. They actually have a racial reconciliation ministry too. And they're very keen to include people with disabilities. So they are a refugium in those three different ways, some very literal, some more about human culture and spiritual life and the, uh, the shape of their church. So they're just a really good example of what it might look like to be the people of refugia. So this people of refugia metaphor calls us essentially to be partners in earth healing, partners with God. We don't do this all by ourselves, of course, God is healing the earth. God is in the redemption business. So we partner with that. And we partner with the earth itself, not destroying or damaging as much as we possibly can, but instead assisting the natural processes like the refugia process in the biological mechanisms of the earth, coming into alignment with how nature works. And the more we know about that through science, the better able we are to do that. And then, of course, I think this is really important, too, and I've reflected on this a lot more really since writing the book, because we are at this point in history where we need to be resilient healers, it's really important that we partner with people outside our sort of Christian lane and maybe outside our little Christian um, subcultures or enclaves, too, that partnership across the borders of the way we organize our lives is really important because this is a huge planetary project we need to be engaged in together. So that partnership is really important. So to sum that up, refugia are meaningful in human culture because they provide relatively safe spaces. They're not entirely safe. Sometimes refugia in nature just don't work. They just fail. Um, there's Because the borders are open and permeable, it's not always entirely safe, but there's a kind of relative safety in the context uh, in which the crisis is happening. Refugia in our human cultures create a kind of freedom to experiment, to try new things. And that smallness is really encouraging. The idea that a small thing can be leveraged for big impact. I think that's a deeply Christian principle too, isn't it? That which is small is not insignificant to God. We see that in scripture all the time. So to have that kind of faith that doing the small, good, faithful thing can connect, can inspire, can witness, can become bigger, that is all part of, I think, refugia theology in a way. Uh, refugia are inclusive because 
This is the idea that biodiversity is resilience in nature, and there's a certain sense in which that's true in human culture as well. So that inclusivity is part of resilience. And finally, this influencing through networks um, is a really complex and beautiful thing in human culture. Finally, I, I think this refugia way of looking at things is a way to model both what needs to challenge us, right? The things that we need to leave behind, the capacities that, are, that we are being challenged to build. But that's not to say it's all like drudgery. There's also joy, joy in the community, joy in the work of it, joy in watching and witnessing to the work of God in this process. So what does this refugia model require of us? Here's just a few thoughts about that. I think repair of our dualisms, especially that matter spirit dualism that's so much part of Christian tradition and indeed other traditions too, but we know it in the Christian tradition. This idea that spirit and matter are somehow binaries and that spirit is always superior to matter, that's a sort of foreign way of dividing up the universe, at least in the Hebrew mindset. It became more um, common in the sort of Greek Hellenistic world. But God clearly in scripture loves this earth. So to disregard it has been a kind of dualism. And there's lots of reasons for that. We could go into a whole history of ideas, but to be conscious of repairing that dualism is I think part of our job right now. And then to repair our individualism and to find our way back to the importance of community, the importance of the common good, the importance of this planet as a kind of commons um, individual and it's just so baked in uh, to American culture. And we have to be cautious about that right now. An expanded view of redemption, this is based on the first one. So to, to really lean into Colossians 1, Christ renewing all things, reconciling all things to himself. Romans 8, the groaning of all creation. You know these verses well. So to really lean into that expanded view of redemption. Um, and then of course, humility. When is humility not important? But especially now, we have so much to learn. And then partnership is that final challenge that I think this refugee model requires of us. So this is the question that I leave you with. What could this mean? What could this mean for you and your community if you thought in terms of that metaphor of refugia? What does it mean to be the people of refugia at this inflection point in history? Thank you so much. Wow, thank you, Deborah, for that. There is so much good stuff. And, and I just want to invite you all here in the chat to answer that question. Maybe what's your first passing thought? Now, that's a deeper question, but what would it look like in your community to be a person of refugia? I, I love that. Deborah, you're going to be joining us for a breakout group in about 30 minutes. So folks, if you have questions and want to talk more directly with her, that'll be a breakout group you can sign up for. Uh, a few things that just kind of strike me, and you're welcome to put some of these in the chat as well. Um, Deborah, just really love the coming back to the liturgical sense. Uh, <laughs> you talked about that liturgical calendar. I, I love that. That that was really good. I also really appreciated that kind of imagery of the Edenic state. Um, you talked about resilient healers. Uh, for me, what struck me was the shift from consumerism to healing you talked about, but one you didn't, indifference to attention. Oh, and I just yeah. love that idea of once you become aware of the brokenness, whatever it might be, and you become attentive to it, um, how much the spirit can use us to work a, a kingdom work in that. Um, and I, I finally had just taken some notes and I know you all were taking notes as well. Just Jesus's master parable, the one he says unlocks everything, the seed in the four soils and how, yeah, uh, Deborah, it's just this image of a small seed that's abundant, that's almost comically abundant when it finds the right soil and how the sower is just really liberal about where he spreads the seed. He, he doesn't really care where it lands because he has so much of it. He's so generous with it and it's really up to the soil, but the seed always does what it's supposed to do. So I do love that, Deborah. Thank you so much. Um, and she'll be one of those breakout groups. What I do want to do is just give you a little bit of an update. So what we're going to do over the next few minutes is invite some of our EEN staff and YCA staff to give us some updates on last year and this year. And then at the end of that, we'll take about a 10-minute break. 
give you time to get up to use the restroom, get something to drink, uh, choose one of those breakout groups you'll be able to self-select for. And then um, at the end of that, we'll start those breakout groups for 40 minutes. Uh, but with that, I'm going to invite my colleague and dear friend, the Reverend Dr. Jessica Mormon, to come off of mute uh, and give us a federal update on some of those accomplishments and a 2023 outlook. Thank you, Marcus. And thank you, Deborah, for just setting the tone so well for the importance of what we are doing here at EEN and what uh, you all our community, our EEN network have accomplished over the last year. I'm going to do my best to fit all this in because there's been so much great work that has been done over the last year and it's just hard to fit it all in. So we'll get started. I want to start though with really grounding us as we think about our policy engagement and our work at EEN just with our guiding principles. And first we are, as you've seen, demonstrated for you today. We are state rooted in scripture. And as Deborah led us through, that is from the very beginning of uh, the Bible with Genesis being called to this awesome assignment to take care of, steward, and heal, <laughs> help participate in the healing of God's creation all the way through Revelation, uh, partnering with God in his work of making all things new and restoration. And in, with that, we're also informed by science. For us at EEN, science is simply studying God's creation, and it gives us incredible insights of how we can uh, take care of his creation and all the people in it in a better way. And really, at the heart of it, we are, are looking to partner with Jesus, as he says in John 10, 10, in this mission for abundant life for all. That, of course, means in our spiritual lives, but also in our physical lives. And so that leads us to our policy pillars of what we look at when we are evaluating policy. And at the center of it, our heart is to defend life, to defend life, especially of those most vulnerable in our communities. That includes our children, both born and unborn, to marginalized and disadvantaged communities here at home and across the world of looking to advance health and advance uh, an abundant life for all. While we do that, we're also protecting God's creation. And then also it has the other amazing co-benefit, not only for health and protecting God's creation, but creating new economic opportunities, especially with the opportunity of family sustaining jobs. And so this is the lens that we bring to uh, as we evaluate policy and push for solutions. And also, I just want to say when it comes to policy, just to de demystify that, what is policy? I just like to think of it as uh, advocating for solutions that we need that we don't yet have. It's simply advocating for solutions that we desperately need that we don't yet have. And that is our joy at EEN to be able to facilitate and provide opportunities for you to get involved and advocate and lift your voice. And so as we look at what we have accomplished over this past year, 2022. This has been a historic year. When I was updating this presentation from our last summit, 2021 was a banner year, and we have yet topped that again in 2022. And really, it, this wouldn't have been possible without you. You sent in thousands of letters to your elected officials and to uh, members of the administration. You gave hundreds of calls, visits. We had dozens of, of oral and public testimony to the EPA and other agency for pollution safeguards. So as we look at the accomplishments of this historic year, it really goes kudos to you. So thank you so much. I have to say, one of our biggest accomplishments was the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act with nearly $370 billion in provisions to combat climate change and pollution. This looks at cutting dangerous greenhouse gases, lowering the cost of energy and providing new uh, avenues and benefits for doing energy efficiency upgrades. Um, one thing that we always love to point out is for the first time, churches can get in on uh, gaining uh, uh, 
rebates for uh, solar installations. There's a new grant for energy efficiency, a new way for churches to steward their finances and the environment through their facilities. I also want to highlight in the Inflation Reduction Act, the Methane Emissions Reduction Program. This is the first federal fee on carbon pollution and is a real game changer. We also saw in this bill, and because of your advocacy, um, up to 60 billion in uh, provisions going straight to frontline communities, those communities that are disproportionately burdened by pollution and climate impact, including communities of color participating in that restorative justice. And then also 20 billion for conservation agriculture programs, bringing our, our farmers and agricultural producers in as partners for the solutions for uh, climate change, soil health, um, and even the hunger crisis. And with all of these incredible provisions, I, I do want to point out that um, with implementing these, it's estimated to create 9 million jobs in climate and energy space, which is just really incredible. Um, also, uh, we saw the passage at the end of the year of something we've been working on for a really long time, the Growing Climate Solutions Act. It got included in the end of year funding package to fund the government. And this is just going to create new ways for our farmers, our ranchers and foresters to uh, be get market incentives to uh, do the good conservation practices that they're already doing and um, be able to sequester carbon. So this was a huge accomplishment here. And then also, I just want to highlight that um, Ian, we were all over Capitol Hill this year and also in the White House, especially with the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, we were able to host a, a Faith Leaders Roundtable that was one of the few opportunities where Republicans and Democrats got together on the committee to have a joint conversation just in line with our um, commitment to bringing people together around the sol solutions to climate change. And then also had the opportunity to testify at the their capstone final hearing uh, just this past December and continue to give that call for bipartisan action for both sides of the aisle to work together in this new Congress in the 118th. And then also we uh, are out representing you at the White House as well with meetings with the president and the vice president, making sure that uh, we're able to, to lift up your voice and your call to care well for God's creation. And so just with my last little bit of time, um, I want to give you an outlook of what we're heading into for 2023. And we've got some big campaigns that we're working on. Um, one key thing to note, even with the wins of the Inflation Reduction Act, the work is not done. There's still so much to do. The Inflation Reduction Act gets us a big way towards our carbon reduction goals, but not all the way. And so that's why we're participating um, in a, a campaign called Solutions for Pollution. And we'll really be pushing for pollution safeguards, um, which defend our children's health but also help address the climate crisis. And so this year, we're going to be engaging on up to a dozen uh, safeguards and rulemakings through the EPA, as well as other uh, executive agencies on, on methane, on soot, um, ozone, power sector carbon emissions. Um, we'll have ways to engage, uh, for you to engage in that process that we're excited uh, to share. We'll also be working on making sure that the climate wins in the Inflation Reduction Act get back home and ensure that those benefits reach communities. And so um, we are will be hosting webinars, getting more information about um, what's in that package that you can bring home. And I'll ask Lindsay to share a few links in the chat um, where you can explore um, within that $370 billion of provisions, um, how that can help you and your community through a resource um, with Rewiring America, um, where you can see what rebates you might be eligible for, as well as a, a guidebook that lists all of the benefits um, in the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, 
And then finally, as we look to uh, uh, legislation and to engagement with Congress, we're going to be engaging on the reauthorization of the Farm Bill. Again, looking at how can we continue to support our farmers and producers in their work of uh, increasing soil health, sequestering carbon and nutrients, and make that easier for more to get involved. We'll be looking at opportunities for boarding carbon adjustment, um, which will help level the playing field and really send a signal that um, for the world to get involved um, in carbon reductions. We'll be looking at community climate resilience, wildfire management, and so much more. So be on the lookout for ways that you can get involved. Um, and I also just want to quickly plug our breakouts. Um, if you want to look at how you can engage in solutions for pollution and support those uh, uh, pollution safeguards, um, as well as meet with your elected officials, uh, join me in uh, the breakout uh, of uh, Champion Creation Care. If you'd like to write, do LTEs, op-eds, join Kyle's breakout, where he's going to go through the process and how we can support you in writing and um, lifting up why you care about all of this with your community. And so with that, I'm going to hand it back to Marcus and the team for our next update. Thank you so much for that, Jessica. And this slide is here now. You can do the QR code. You can drop, go to the link that Lindsay will drop. But all of that information, if you want to be an EEN champion, there are ways to get involved with that directly. Thank you so much, Jessica. I love the starting with the scripture, the faith values, and then moving into action. So with that, I'd love to turn to Kim Anderson, our Associate Director of Pennsylvania and Ohio Outreach at EEN, to talk about things at a more local level uh, and some of the accomplishments from last year and some of the outlook for next year. Kim? Thank you, Marcus. And I'm excited to share uh, some amazing things that happened in this couple of states that we work in last year and talk about what we plan to do this year. Um, we're a national organization, as you know, but we do state work in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Indiana. And um, I've been here about two years and it's been fun to watch the movement in those states in the last couple of years. Um, some major things that we are involved in are state and regional, co regional coalitions where we um, focus on policy. Um, we meet with key state policymakers to educate them on policy within the states. Uh, we mobilize people to write op-eds and letters to the editor to speak at public hearings. And I'm proud to say that um, we had about 40% of the people that spoke at public hearings um, last week for the EPA methane rule were from states that we do state work in. So, um, you know, we're building relationships and mobilizing people to take action for creation care. Um, and then finally, we're planning for state and lo or for local state hubs. So these are regional groups that meet on a regular basis. And in 2022, we had a lot of success with a couple of these. Um, in Cleveland, we had, um, in Cleveland and Columbus, we did the partners training and we had some amazing relationships developed out of that and have some work that um, we're planning for the new year based on some of those relationships. We had um, about 40 people total that attended the program um, in person there between Columbus and Cleveland last year. Um, in Philadelphia, we had a big lunch last May where we had some amazing speakers. We got a lot of people very excited. And um, I'm excited to share that, um, you know, we're planning to do more of that this year. Um, in Indiana, we hosted something called Creation Fest, where we had different vendors come throughout. And um, and then people showed up. We had prayed for, um, I think it was around 70 people and were overwhelmed with the number of people that came. There were about 260 and 30 vendors. And next year, we're hoping to have um, over 500 at that event. Um, we've developed last year strong partnerships in Philadelphia as well and are looking forward to how we're going to move those forward. Um, some challenges, you know, we've learned that um, we need to balance local. Uh, local leadership with, um, you know, EEN's influence and guidance. And um, so we're, we're learning a lot of lessons and um, it's just making us stronger. Uh, I was reminded when um, our keynote speaker was talking about the liturgical calendar. And one of the things I'm most excited about for next year is that in Philadelphia, we've started to plan a 
uh, an annual rhythm. I think uh, as humans, we're used to that. As Christians, we're used to that in many of our churches. And so um, people will know what to expect. Like in February, we'll do something like this. In May, we'll tend to do something like that. And so people will kind of have an idea of what to expect every year. And um, and we plan to continue to, to grow uh, those groups through that that kind of methodology. Um, and we have planning meetings coming up in Indiana and Cleveland um, in the next few weeks, as well as Dayton, Ohio. Uh, we're having an event planned there in April. Um, so those are some of the highlights. Um, we've had some wonderful success in policy, as well as in creating, growing, and deepening new relationships. And we tend to expand those in, um, in new cities within the states that we do state work in. Um, and to plug the breakout groups, we're going to have a breakout group with the two pastors that we worked with in Philadelphia to kind of talk about some of the things that we've done and um, what we're hoping to do in the future. And if you are looking to do local work, it would be a good idea to come to that and get some ideas. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you for that, Kim. I've been in some of those meetings with you, uh, whether it be in Cleveland or I was there in Columbus and in Philadelphia. And one of the things that Kim mentioned, I just want to bring back up is the local leadership is important. We're happy to put our resources, our training at your disposal, uh, whether you're in those states, whether you're in Georgia like myself, uh, we want to train you and equip you. But more than anything, we want to inspire you to do the work that God's calling you to do in your community. And we never want to lose track of that. Uh, but there is lots of work going on geographically, but even across the generational cohort. So I want to invite my dear friend and colleague, Tori Global, who's the national organizer and spokesperson for YCA, to tell us a little bit about some of the work they did last year and especially what they have going on this year. So Tori, please join us. Thank you, Marcus. Hello, friends. It is so wonderful to be here with you at Summit 23. Like Marcus said, my name is Tori Goble, and I serve as the National Organizer for Young Evangelicals for Climate Action, YUCA, EN's ministry partner. Today, I want to share some of my favorite highlights from 2022 and share what's coming up for YUCA in the coming months. 2022 was another great year for our ministry at YUCA. In November, five young people had the opportunity to attend COP27 in Egypt as official UN climate observers through the Christian Climate Observers Program, an immersive experience that YECA has helped to lead every year. This year, EEN was invited to be a part of a panel at an event hosted by Speaker Pelosi and the US delegation. Elsa Barron, a former YECA fellow, had the opportunity to represent EEN and YECA and share about why she cared about climate action as a young person of faith. Afterwards, Elsa and another YUCA leader were approached by Speaker Pelosi, and she shared how important it is for young people to get involved, especially in a bipartisan way. 2022 was another impactful year for our leadership development programs as well. In the spring, we were especially honored to be selected as one of 10 finalists for the American Climate Leadership Awards in recognition of our Climate Leadership Fellows Program. And I'm excited to share more about that college program in just a few moments. Finally, we ended the year with a voter engagement campaign designed to equip young Christians with the tools and resources to get out and vote with climate in mind. Our Love God, Love Your Neighbor, Vote for Climate campaign had three main goals. To mobilize potential voters in key states, to equip YUCA's volunteers and leaders with the tools to reach out to their own communities, and to share the stories of young people voting with climate in mind. Through this campaign, we texted over 84,000 young Christians in Arizona, Wisconsin, and Georgia. To accomplish this, we hosted nine text banks throughout the midterm election season and during the Georgia runoff. Additionally, we launched new tools and resources to help people check their voter registration status, get registered to vote, and request absentee ballots. Overall, over 1,000 actions were taken through these tools. I also wanna take a moment to celebrate the incredible work of our college fellows across the country. YECA's College Fellowship is designed to train and equip young people to take concrete action on their college campuses. In addition to some incredible voter engagement work, over the past year, YECA fellows have organized 96 events with over 3,700 attendees, started recycling, clothing swaps, and composting programs, 
and held over 50 meetings with school decision makers, including professors, school presidents, and other key staff. This past semester, for example, Noel at Pepperdine University successfully worked to have housing services pay for and install 200 new composting bins in campus residential buildings. This is just a small sample of the incredible work being done at Christian colleges around the country. And we are so thrilled with all that these students have accomplished. So what's next for YECA? Like EEN, we are engaging with the EPA methane rule comment period. Just last week, YECA staff and a handful of young people testified at the public hearing, and we are currently collecting comments for the EPA. In the next month, we will also be launching applications for the 2023-24 cohort of college fellows. So if you know someone who will be in college for the next academic year and would be interested in this program, please send them our way. Additionally, we are now accepting applications for our community fellowship, a similar program designed to support young people on the front lines of the climate crisis. Please be sure to sign up for emails and check out our website to learn more and stay connected. Thank you so much for being here and I will be in the chat if anyone has any questions. Yeah, I love that so much. Thank you, Tori. So I'm going to leave this slide up on the screen for a little bit so you can start to see some of those breakouts that we're offering. Uh, it's 1253 now. What we'll do is take a short break from 1255 to 105. So those that are hosting those uh, breakout groups, you want to give your folks time and then get started at 105. And then we'll go to about 145. Um, real quick, just to note, again, these slides will be available to you early next week. This recording will be available to you next week. And it's just important to say over and over again that all the work that we're doing at EEN, I love it. It's so lovely that we get to do all this. But I'm more excited about what you all are doing, whether it's at YECA, whether it's as a champion or a partner, as an LTE or an op-ed writer, or as somebody giving comment to the EPA. You significantly magnify the work that Christ is doing in the world when you raise your hand and say, yes, I want to witness and I want to share my value. So thank you so much. So with that, I'm going to leave this slide up for a few minutes. You're welcome to join. You should be able to hit join a breakout room. Lindsay, I believe that to be true. Um, and they can join those breakout rooms one through five. Um, go to the breakout room. It'll start at 105. And then we'll take a break starting at 145. And we'll start back here in this main room at 155. That's a lot of numbers. So start your breakout at 105, take another break around 145, and then we'll get back here at 155 for our ending with the EPA and Mitch. Thank you. Well, welcome back everyone. Hopefully you had a chance to get a quick break in there. I know some of those conversations in the breakout rooms went a little long and I cannot wait to hear about how those conversations went, some of the things you learned, some of the things that uh, you found interesting. Uh, the work of what we do here at EEN really is focused around you and what God's calling you to in your context and your community. So cannot be happier that you had a chance to do that. I do want to invite off of Mitch, a uh, off, off, off of mute, a voice we have not heard yet today, which is uh, our executive director and president, Re Reverend Mitchell Hescox. I I'm excited because throughout the course of the day, we've heard a lot about the EPA. Uh, we heard about it from Dr. Jessica Mormon. We heard about it from Kim and from Tori. Uh, we've seen it in slides, giving comments. And so, Mitch, maybe I'd love for you to maybe set up this special message. We're going to hear from the administrator of the EPA, why we thought it was so important to have that. And then uh, on the other side of those comments, Mitch, I'd love to re-invite you back to share in a little bit more context about the uh, important work that our community can do and should be doing, uh, especially since this is your last year with us at Summit as the executive director and the president. So Mitch, yeah, please feel free to come off of mute and set up our next part. Well, thank you, Marcus. And this has been an exceptional summit. So thank you and the team and Lindsay for all the hard work you did at organizing it. And it is my pleasure to come and be a part of this. And you'll hear more of some remarks from me later. But EPA has been pivotal in life of saving children's health. You know, its message is to protect public health and the environment. 
And for me, creation care is a matter of life. It's about protecting children, especially unborn and newly born children from the ravages of pollution. And we have a lot here. And I was privileged. Um, I've done a lot of work with the EPA over the years. I'm a member of the Clean Air Act Advisory Committee for the EPA. And literally the day that um, Administrator Regan was confirmed, I was asked to meet with him and get to know him a little bit. And I've met with him several times since. But he's from North Carolina grew up, learned about God's creation from going to church and also being an avid fisher and hunter. Before joining EPA, he was the director of the Department of Environmental Protection for the state of North Carolina. Great gentleman, nice man. In fact, uh, one of the things that I just remember from my first meeting with him, if you know me, I always offer to pray with whoever I meet with. And uh, his, he sort of chuckled and said, my mom would be really glad that you're praying for me because she knows that I need it. So one of the comments he had, but I'm just so thankful that he took the time out to give us a short message just to thank EEN for its work because um, EEN has a great reputation at the EPA. You know, we've done a lot of work over the years from the mercury and air toxic standard. We were back in 2015 and 16, the organization that was responsible for getting the first methane standard out the door of the EPA by the force and the will of our community to make that happen. And we've done a lot since then, and we have more to do, which I'll talk about later. But first, let's hear the brief remarks and sort of a thank you from the 16th administrator of the EPA, Mr. Michael Regan. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to speak at this year's Evangelical Environmental Network Summit. It's my honor to join you virtually. One of my top priorities as administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency is ensuring that all people, regardless of the color of their skin, the money in their pocket, or the community they live in, have clean air to breathe, clean water to drink, and the opportunity to lead a healthy life. And at EPA, we're working hard every day to secure safer and healthier communities across the country. As you know, our agency recently took bold action to tackle climate pollution and protect public health by strengthening our proposed standards to cut methane and other harmful pollution from oil and natural gas operations. And earlier this month, we announced a proposal to strengthen a key national ambient air quality standard for fine particulate matter so that we can better protect our communities. With actions like these combined with unprecedented resources from both the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act, we are making way for a brighter and cleaner planet for our children and the generations that will come after them. I want to take a moment to thank the Evangelical Environmental Network. Organizations like EEN are critical to advancing our work. Thank you for your advocacy and continue to support as we work together to build a healthier and safer world for all. I wish you all the best and hope you enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you. Well, thank you, Administrator Regan, for being giving that message. And Marcus, if you'd like to jump us in, go right ahead if you'd like to say something. Yeah, I was just gonna re-invite you, Mitch. We heard a lot of things about children and health and water and air and just maybe speaking to some of our values. So I'd love for you to share again, just those values and why it's so important for our community to do what it is that they do. Sure. Well, thank you, Marcus, again. And, and again, folks, Marcus is right, is that uh, after almost 15 years, I will be retiring from EEN come you know, the end of July. So this is sort of my swan song few months of giving my last bit of wisdom and what things that I can do to keep propelling EEN forward. Because let me first assure you that EEN now has the best staff, staff that I've ever worked at. We have great intelligence and faith and strength in the commitment to caring for God's creation. Because our number one message for the past, you know, 13 or 14 years has been creation care is a matter of life. Because everything we put into God's creation that isn't supposed to be there comes back out that harms our children, harms all of us as humanity, harms all of God's creation. And it's become that really central theme to who we are as an organization. You know, Isaiah 24 puts it this way, human beings destroy the earth because they don't follow God's commandments. We've been given commandments to care for the earth, to be good stewards, 
In fact, Leviticus 25 reminds us that, you know, the earth is the Lord's and we are but tenants. That there's a contractual arrangement for us to be good stewards, to take care of God's creation. And for me, nowhere is that more important than caring about children's health. And it also happens to be the easiest way to talk to fellow evangelical Christians about the impacts of pollution is by talking about how it harms our kids. 37% of American kids have autism, ADHD, severe allergies, and they're all related to how we use petrochemicals or fossil fuels. We're changing the way we think. We're changing our DNA. Something called PM 2.5 that the administrator talked about, small pieces of dust, two and a half microns in size, smaller than a piece of hair, are filled with heavy metals and other things that are now known and linked to dementia and the rise of it, as well as birth defects and other things. It is an important way. And the number one place that we create PM 2.5 is the burning of fossil fuels worldwide. We kill at least 9 million people with pollution around the world. PM 2.5 kills probably 200 people, 200,000 people a year in the United States. And that doesn't have to be. And that's why we need agencies like the EPA. You know, it would be really nice if everyone would live and act the way God intended them to act, that we'd be living in a place where we live in the kingdom of God right now, where it's fully realized. But unfortunately, we don't. In fact, one of the things that people who are pretty conservative, what do you do with the EPA for? What do you worry about all these regulations? And I said, well, if people won't do what's right on their own, they have to be held accountable. Just as God holds us accountable when we break God's laws and sin, we seek forgiveness. In the real world, we have to seek consequences for those who continue to pollute. And we are literally destroying God's creation and harming our kids. But there is hope. You know, as Paul Douglas wrote in the book that we made a couple of years ago, we're not helpless or hopeless, but we do have to act. And I am literally, if I can be a little bit prideful today, I am thankful for the team that we've assembled. From Kyle and Jessica and Marcus and Lindsay and Kim and Tori, and now our newest addition who just started two days ago, Carolyn, we have a fantastic team and we're looking for at least one more person right now to help on federal policy. So if anybody's interested in joining the EN team and wants to live in the Washington area, you know, send me an email and we'll talk. But it's exciting to see what we've made and what is accomplished over my tenure to EN. You know, it's been rewarding. Probably one of the neatest things that ever happened was um, 10 years ago, we did something, worked on something called the MAD standard, mercury and air toxic standard. It's something that should have been taking place back in the 70s. And Congress and EPA and everybody hummed and hailed for over 30 years about putting into place. And back in 2009 and 2010, we know that one in six children in the United States were being born from with brain damage from mercury coming out of coal-fired power plants. And EEN was able to work with Republicans in Congress. We were able to work with the White House. We were able to work with EPA. And we got that mercury and air toxic standard put out there. And the day that we made sure that it went through the Congress and the Senate, there was a little celebration at a restaurant for a few of us in Washington, D.C. President policy for the American Lung Association walked up to me and said, Mitch, you and your EEN team just saved millions of kids' lives. That's a memory that I will take and live with, but that's the more we have to do and can do. Because the team that's ahead of you is we have a lot of work to do right now. And I'm going to ask you right now, as I you know, continue to talk a little bit, to have, you know, Lindsay's going to put up again to go to our action page right now. February 13th is the day that the latest methane rule closes. We need to have more and more people submit comments there. You can sign up there, use the form that's on our website to take to make sure that that particular rulemaking gets done, gets done quickly. 
It's actually the supplemental that came out a couple months ago is actually pretty good. It needs to be cleaned up in a couple areas. First one is it needs to prevent flaring from happening around the country because that just wastes gas and puts poison in the air. It needs to do a better job of sealing up tanks. They have a sort of a flimsy thing for tanks. And also we want to put in a thing for that helps communities be able to do self-monitoring and report that monitoring, not just to companies, but to the EPA as well. And that's some fallacies. So I'd really appreciate if you'd go there and do that. And at the same time, the Bureau of Land Management, BLM, is working on a role to stop flaring, primarily in the Western United States, in New Mexico, in Colorado, in Wyoming, in North Dakota, where they flare all the time. And that flaring gas, number one, and, and the rule they're making is called for waste gas because what they flare doesn't count of what they pay the government for the royalty fees on federal land. Plus, it's a terrible health impact, too, but the rolling is because of money, and so it's a good stewardship issue. So that's out there as well as our website. You heard the administrator talk about PM 2.5. That rulemaking was just released two weeks ago. It isn't yet ready for comment, but it's coming out basically asking for comments of how to make PM 2.5, this small, really dust stuff that has that metal compact attached to it and causes dimension, things I mentioned again before. They're kind of keep this, trying to keep this standard to 10 micrograms per cubic meter, which the latest medical research says it's not, we're still doing significant harm at five micrograms per liter. So we're going to wait, work to toughen that rule up. And then Jessica said all the wonderful things that's happening in Congress. You know, we had EN played its role in the IRA getting done. We played its role in the, in the bipartisan infrastructure bill. We did some works on the CHIP Act. And there's a lot of things that, this ministry, thanks be to God, can be proud of because of what we've done. And we just really want you to be engaged with us because we need you. And so I have a couple of requests. As I close my tenure out here at EEN over the next six months, those on this summit call, I would like to do one thing. One, help us be engaged with all those rule makings. There's two right now, and we need your help. And number two, I'd like each of you to consider starting or expanding a creation care program in your own congregation or wherever you work. We'll help you do that. Marcus and team will be happy to come out and do a partner's training. We'll do it on site. We'll help you get started. But I have a dream that every church in America, especially every evangelical church, will see that being caring for God's creation is not being an environmentalist, it's being a disciple of Christ. That's the exciting thing to think about, is working on God's creation is not some progressive ideal, it's a biblical command. And with that, I see Marcus coming up, he's probably wanting me to really, you know, close it up now and say it, but I just want to thank you for a marvelous 15 years at EEN. I'm not quite leaving yet, the board of directors is working on hiring my replacement. But the one thing I am assured of is the team that we have assembled now will do better works than I ever did because God is at the source and the strength. So thank you for being part of EEN. Help us to do further. Help us to protect our kids. Help us to take everything we can do to care for God's creation and to make this a better place by defending all God's children all over the world. Thanks be to God and thank you. Take care now. Amen. Thank you for that, Mitch. Uh, well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to start sharing some ways that you can get involved directly, what we like to call exit ramps here. But I did just want to make sure that I took a moment again to thank Mitch for his leadership, for his vision, uh, for his encouragement of the team, myself included. Uh, this work would not be possible without uh, prophetic vision. And Mitch, you have carried that in spades. And so just thank you for that so much. It's been really good. So over the course of today, we've given you a lot of information. And I know it's been a lot. We'll get those recordings out to you and those slides out to you. But um, what I'd love to do with the limited amount of time we have left right now, if I can get these slides to come up the way we need them to, is share a few of the opportunities that we have ahead of us uh, in the next few weeks and then in the next few months as well. So I'm gonna share my screen 
And then, uh, or there we go. Thank you so much there, Lindsay. Uh, first and foremost, uh, in a few short days, uh, Dr. Jessica Mormon, who you've had a chance to hear from today already, will be with President Walter Kim of the National Association of Evangelicals. We're actually very excited about this opportunity because on the one hand, yes, we want you to sign up. You can use the QR code or use the link that's being put in the chat to watch and consume and, and see that. But there's also an opportunity for you to participate. Uh, I know I've talked to Dr. Jessica Mormon already, and there is an opportunity for you to lead a watch party. You can do that with your small group, your life group. You can do that at your congregation. Um, what we're encouraging you to do and what we will resource you to do is to lead a hybrid model where you'll watch some of this virtually and then have a discussion in person live with your watch party. And so I know Dr. Jessica Mormon is very excited about that opportunity. I'm very excited about that opportunity. So if you're looking for something small you can do right away, this is a great next step. It's something that you can do virtual and in person, and we'll do a lot of the heavy lifting. Another opportunity we have for you right around the corner uh, is the opportunity to join our Beth Bond Memorial Book Club. Some of you know that this happens seasonally in the spring and in the fall. Uh, we had Deb sh show up today and speak to us live but we're gonna journey for six weeks through her book, Refugia Faith. Uh, each week, what we'll do is have a teaching input at the front, and then we'll go into breakout groups and have discussion questions around what we read each week. This is another great opportunity for you to invite someone from your church, your congregation, your community, your work, to sit in and join. Again, it's low stakes, high opportunity. We'll do the heavy lifting of getting together the steady questions, and doing the input, we just invite you to register. The website's live now and invite others to register so that you can journey through this book with us this season. We have another opportunity for you as well to be an EEN champion. Maybe you're already done book club several times or the, 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 the webinar with the National Association of Evangelicals isn't quite enough for you. You wanna do more, you wanna write, you wanna do comments you want to reach out to your local and federal uh, leaders, signing up to be an EEN champion is a great way to take action all year around. So you can scan the QR code or go to the link that's going to get dropped in the chat box to sign up to be an EEN champion, and we will resource you so that you can take action right away. We also have an opportunity to share our voice with the methane rule that's coming out. Mitch has mentioned it, Jessica's mentioned it, but again, I wanna give you the visual and re-invite you for the third time to tell the EPA to defend our children's health and future from methane pollution. You'll hear more about that throughout this year, talking about methane and some of those problems, but here's a great way early on to witness for the next generation and for our neighborhoods. Lastly, uh, we want to give you an opportunity to donate. We could not do this wonderful ministry that we do without the help of the Holy Spirit in your giving. In fact, we do believe, and we, we spend this all the time, we spend time praying all the time that the Lord blesses this ministry so that we can continue to help children, help neighborhoods, and help Christians rediscover and reclaim that biblical mandate to care for creation. And as Mitch talked about just a second ago, our team is growing. There's more work to do. The harvest is plentiful, as Jesus said. And so your ability to donate, whatever it is, however small or however big it is, or tell others to donate, invites them into the work that we do here at EEN. So I so appreciate you taking an opportunity to prayerfully discern if that's something that the Lord is calling you into. Lastly, I do just want to end us in scripture the same way we started with scripture and prayer. And that's a reminder that the resurrected Christ, Jesus, taught his disciples and told his disciples to go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. Thank you so much for joining us at Summit this year. We can't wait to see you out there. Thanks. Take care. <laughs>